Khal Rasin made history. He is the first elected Attorney General in the District of Columbia. Who is Khal Rasin? Will he be another run-of-the-mill politician who talked the talk during the campaigns but afterwards do not walk the walk? Well, Khal Rasin is here with us. Stay tuned. Carib Nation is up next. Hello, I'm Paul Nehru, Tennessee, for Carb Nation. With us today is Mr. Carl Racin. He is the first elected Attorney General in the District of Columbia. Mr. Racine, welcome to Carb Nation program. It's a great pleasure to be with you, Paul. And I'm very happy also to welcome students of UDC who are in Discovery Civics course. So they are going to get a civic education from you today. Who are you, Mr. Racine? How did you become the first elected Attorney General in D.C.? Paul, uh, first, uh, let me just again say how much of a great pleasure it is to be with you uh, and to be a part of this uh, television program. I follow it regularly. I know it is a key source of great information, hard news and culture for the Caribbean community throughout the world. Also, I'm very honored to be in the company of tremendous students at the University of the District of Columbia. As you know, my mother has taught at this university for well over 45 years now. She's Professor Emeritus. I grew up uh, with the history of the Uni University of the District of Columbia, and believe me when I say it's an honor to be here. Who am I um, begins really with my familial roots. Uh, I am the proud son of Marie Racine, Dr. Racine, and her husband, Edzair Racine. My family members, um, are from Haiti. Uh, you should know that our family lineage and history is one that always is focused on education and public service. In that regard, my mother was a longtime educator. Her family continues to educate kids in Haiti. And my father was a public servant, serving as mayor of, uh, of, his, of a small town in Haiti. The other piece you should know is that we are a family of activists. We care about real people and real people's concerns, and we're willing to do something, even risk our lives, um, in order to secure the freedom and liberty of other people. So you're a Haitian Caribbean American. I am a Haitian Caribbean American who's fundamentally oriented for the good of people. And your dad was also a diplomat at the United Nations. That is correct. Yeah. So did you get influenced very young by when you were a kid by your parents in terms of public service? Uh, no doubt about it. Uh, you know, my mother, for example, as a teacher, went beyond the job of 9 to 3 p.m. or 9 to 5 p.m. Literally, we had students at our house throughout the evening. My mother was a prolific independent study uh, person where kids would always be at our house. And sure enough, uh, we knew from moment one that the business of education and of giving of yourself to others was quite important. Well, I'm also aware, because I know your mom very well, and um, the background of your family. You all, your mom left Haiti and your dad afterwards because of tremendous repression during the Duvalier regime. Did that make you committed to the ideas of freedom and liberal democracy, probably much stronger than most people would who would have been born into a liberal democracy? It's absolutely a part of our DNA, uh, and it certainly was in the bones of my sister and I. We knew early on uh, that we had family members and friends who put their lives on the, li on the line and lost their lives defending the liberty and independence of others. And we knew from moment one that, indeed, whatever it is that we would do in the United States had to include a public concern. Now, I know you grew up in D.C. 
Can you tell us a bit about your nurturing here at the various high schools and DC as a community? DC, a lot of people are not aware, is a place of many neighborhoods. So many neighborhoods, Paul, as you indicated. Um, I can tell you we live the life of an immigrant, a typical immigrant family. My parents left, my sister and I, in Haiti when they came here to first get established. Um, they moved around in different neighborhoods until they were able to find a suitable uh, apartment for rent. We joined them uh, when I was only three years old. My sister at the time was five. I remember living in five different neighborhoods before we settled in the area where we did not so far from the University of District of Columbia. Uh, we attended public schools. I eventually graduated from St. John's uh, College Military High School here in D.C., but in a real way, we understood because of our immigrant roots, as well as being open-minded and active in churches and in pro bono type of activities as kids, that we were part of a multicultural city that is D.C. And your athletic prowess, I've heard good things about it. Can you tell us a bit about it? Well, I, I appreciate that. A lot of my friends, they criticize me for not being as good as been, has been reported. Um, but in fact, I played sports throughout my life. I quite uh, took to sports. Uh, and indeed, uh, basketball became my game, if you will. And as it turned out, through excellent uh, coaching and great, great mentors, uh, I was a high school all-star player here, all-metropolitan player uh, in uh, Washington, D.C., and was able to go on and play basketball for the University of Pennsylvania. I can tell you that basketball has provided another extraordinary experience in understanding the breadth of people, the fact that folks from different walks in life have different talents, and that the best teams and the best leaders are those who can bring out the strengths in people and put them in a position to excel. So sports has played an incredible role in my life. Can you give us a bit of insight into your professional life? I read you worked with the White House as an attorney. You were at a very prominent law firm in D.C. and you were a public defender. Yes. Uh, what insights do all that professional experience provide now that you are here on this new journey as the first elected attorney general? Well, I believe in uh, the sanctity and the dignity of my clients. No client is so sophisticated, so elite, um, as to deserve more than any other client. So, for example, the Public Defender Service, my clients were people in the District of Columbia uh, who could not afford a lawyer, both kids and adults. And I represented uh, my clients there with the same amount of zeal that I would later represent the President of the United States, or clients who could afford to pay for my services at you know very, very good law firms. So, um, once again, it, my diversity of my practice reinforced lessons that my parents taught me about the in, that, that in the dignity of, of an individual and how every individual deserves the best that life has to offer. Now in our civics uh, course that I teach, we are aware that in all the states of the United States, there are elected attorney generals. Yes. Why is it, lo and behold, only today or this month, we've had for the first time an elected attorney general. Can you explain the, the uniqueness of district government in relation to the rest of the country? Well, you said it correctly. Uh, there are 43 elected attorney general in the United States, so only seven states do not have elected attorney general. Um, as to why it took so long for the District of Columbia to move to an elective attorney general, I think you're, you're, you're right in your suggestion that a lot of this is tied up with the unique history of, of D.C. and the sovereignty that we have now with limited statehood. I believe that with the step of now having an elected attorney general, um, it's just a further uh, marker of progress as to our ultimately gaining statehood. Can you walk us through a bit? We had 2010, 2010 when the legislation was uh, amended the charter in order that we have an elected then there was a problem in 2012, then went to court in 2013, and finally 2014 was resolved. Can you explain to us so we have a, a better insight on how D.C. government works in relation specifically to your position as elected attorney? Sure. Uh, so the attorney general's position in D.C. Um, 
which was previously called the Corporation Council. And around 2005, the name changed, it was a very, very good change, to Attorney General in order to give that office the same stature or standing as the other state's number one legal officials had. Um, to be honest, the manner in which the council legislation was drafted was, was really not the picture of a thorough, deliberative, and a thoughtful process. In fact, what occurred was that the council uh, was very irate with a particular attorney general, uh, who was at that time the attorney general uh, under, uh, under uh, Mayor Fenty. And they were so irate with that attorney general that they passed a law making the attorney general position subject to election, not appointment. To become independent of the mayor. To become independent of the mayor. And they wanted that uh, position independent of the mayor because they thought that that particular attorney general was not independent of the mayor and was in many ways, uh, was the belief, acting as the mayor's lawyer. Well, the motivation was personal and, uh, frankly, emotional. After Mayor Fenty lost the, his reelection, of course, a new mayor came in, a new council came in. The council then started walking back the legislation that it passed. Legislation, in fact, that turned into a referendum that the people adopted. It seemed as though the council's motivation was primarily focused on their ire as to the attorney general Who initiated under Mayor a Fenty. Referendum? Uh, the, the council the proposed this in a, oh, in a referendum, and the referendum passed by nearly 80 percent. And so this means the citizens voted. That's exactly right, which means the citizens of the District of Columbia determined that, yes, like 43 other states, they too should elect an attorney general who would not only represent the city and the government interest, but also the public interest. And then there was a time snack. Then there was, a, as you say, a, a time snack. It's an interesting term. Um, sure enough, you know, I think that the council understood that it was primarily motivated in a personal way as opposed to more of a broad policy manner with respect to the attorney general. And there were concerns as to whether there would be suitable f people applying for election for attorney general. So the council started walking back that legislation. And sure enough, a court process ensued, a court process that was led by one of my opponents who deserves great credit, Paul Zuckerberg, um, defending the people's action on the referendum. And eventually, after a tortured court process, Mr. Zuckerberg's case prevailed. And sure enough, the elected attorney general was put on the ballot in July for an election that just occurred on November 4th. Now, I saw, unlike your other candidates, that you had a lot of support across the various wards. Now, what was your platform that made you such an interesting candidate? Well, uh, indeed, you are uh, correct. First, we ran, I think, a, a very, very strong, uh, hardworking, comprehensive campaign where, in a short uh, three-and-a-half-month period, we determined that we wanted every vote in every ward, um, period. And so, sure enough, we did win every ward, and that was our goal, to win all eight wards. I think the message that resonated yeah. um, from, uh, from our campaign was that this position required independent leadership and required um, a record of experience from, of an individual who has defended, as we discussed early on, the poorest people in the District of Columbia, but has also had comprehensive uh, experience representing people and companies in the most complex cases. Leadership and experience was very important uh, as a theme in this race. I also believe that the people very much wanted to focus on a leader who talked to each of them. That's why we were able to receive the votes from all eight wards. That's why we received an overwhelming majority of the white vote and the African-American vote. It's because we reached out and we listened to concerns like affordable housing, like juvenile justice, and we determined that we would absolutely 
attack those issues when we became when we became elected. So there's great expectations on the part of the system, but I'm a bit curious. Who's your boss? If the mayor is not your boss, who's your boss? Who do you report? Well, I, uh, I view my boss as the, the people. The um, people. So the, you're a man of the people. I'm, I'm absolutely a man of the people. I have been in, elected uh, by the people, and I serve uh, at their will. And they'll have an opportunity in four years uh, to, uh, to speak on the job that yeah. we've done. Now, citizens will have great expectations. What are you going to do about information, access, participation, and influence of the people? Uh, an exceptional question, and in fact, that's one of the markers of having an elected attorney general as opposed to an appointed attorney general. Um, we believe that the people should have full access to the attorney general's office. And so what we're going to do immediately is establish an office of community outreach. The community outreach is going to be an office that meets our clients. That's the people of the District of Columbia where they are. That uh, listens to the citizens of the District of Columbia in regards to issues and concerns that they have, that also goes about proactively educating our citizens on the myriad of issues that are of great import today, issues like affordable housing. And during the campaign, we were able to, you know, clearly understand that there is a lot of anxiety in the District of Columbia around the issue of affordable housing, a lot of fear and certainly lack of understanding. May I pin a point here? You're touching on something that we deal with in, a, in the civics class. It's called gentrification. Right. Now, you just said that a lot of white folks voted for you and black folks. Now, the white folks are moving back into the city, and the black folks, a lot of them, are giving the incentives to move out of the city. Now, you said affordable housing. That's the key, because if poor black folks can have affordable housing, they'll stay in the city. How are you going to balance those two interests? Well, uh, first, uh, we have to understand that um, I'm the attorney general, and I'm not you know, the, uh, the counsel. Okay. So I'm not drafting uh, new laws. I certainly have a view and will opine uh, on uh, laws that uh, have been passed in other jurisdictions that are facing the same issues of uh, gentrification that are doing a, a good job of balancing the interest. That's one. What I will do, however, is certainly educate our citizens on what the law is. There are citizens, be it seniors, um, citizens who've been in D.C. for a long time, and indeed young citizens, young white citizens, who don't understand the benefits, the subsidies that are out there for them. They don't understand, frankly, the complex system of making affordable housing available. And so our job is to demystify it, make it more available so that people can actually benefit from the programs that are on the books now. Now, like yourself, we have uh, a young mayor who has just been elected, and she was credited with having legislated an ethics legislation. Uh, can you, would that legislation have anything to do with your office in terms of what you can do, or would you have anything to do with that ethics legislation? Because here in D.C., a lot of people have been disillusioned with the contradictions, if not to use the word corruption, of some of the council members who are now in deep trouble. Sure, uh, and in fact, uh, you know, the mayor-elect deserves credit uh, for her leadership on the issue with respect to passage of the new ethics bill. And certainly, as Attorney General, it would be my responsibility in many important aspects of that law to enforce the law. Um, I'm of the view, again, respecting the legislature, uh, that uh, we can pass an even stronger uh, ethics bill where we eliminate the pay-to-play politics. So you would be able to play a role in that? Uh, I certainly will be able to play a role with that. Oh, well, that's good news, very good news. Another matter I'd like to raise with you, and this is a national issue, it's across America people have been complaining that judges are elected, judges, and they have to make decisions. But they need finance, and they spend a lot of time raising finance from rich people. And you know, the whole thing of campaign finance. Who are you beholden to? The people that give you money, the rich people? Or to the people who elect you? Now, you were the first, you are the first elected attorney general in D.C. 
I imagine your campaign had to be financed by somebody. Uh, who are you beholden to? I'm beholden to the law. I'm beholden to ethics. I'm beholden to uh, the people uh, who will absolutely uh, already have the ability to uh, review my campaign finance reports uh, and to make judgments on their own as to whether any decision that I make has been impacted by a donor. But in my pledge, uh, uh, my pledge as Attorney General is to, uh, to really call it as I see it, consistent with the facts in the law, and not be holden to any uh, special interest, nor a contributor, nor association that I may have had previously. The, the thing is that uh, there is a lot of disquiet about campaign finance. Yes. And in a, a specific relation to the district, uh, would you be having an opinion or would you be playing a role in relation to how that could be improved? I mean, we could have better laws and better accountability and transparency. Uh, no, no doubt about it. Uh, in fact, I should tell you that, uh, again, uh, the mayor-elect deserves a lot of credit for what she was able to pass. I know that the mayor-elect is focused on you know, even strengthening that law, and it certainly is within my jurisdiction to provide her with counsel, suggestion and indeed legislation as to what the states, uh, what the best states in the United States are doing. States that have the lowest indicator of corruption. There are states like Oregon and Washington State, even California, that have very rigid laws in regards to campaign finance and procurement areas. And those that's laws- That's very important, procurement those, too. That's right, and those laws definitively. I think that's the key. and. Uh, I want to raise quickly another issue with you very quickly. It's uh, we have a Homeland Security program here. We also have a criminal justice program. We're very concerned about returned citizens and their rights. Yes. Would that be within your portfolio to address that issue about the rights of returned citizens? There is no doubt uh, that uh, going about making laws and enforcing laws that provide benefits for returning citizens is within my jurisdiction. And I believe that that is our fundamental, not problem. Just for our audience, and many of them may not know what's sure. a return citizen. Return sure, citizen. returning citizen, in short, is a citizen who has been uh, involved in the criminal justice system, may in fact have been incarcerated. Um, many, many, many of our citizens, unfortunately, have gone through the criminal justice system. And when they come out, they struggle. They struggle with getting the basics, like identification, like an opportunity to have a job. And so it is fundamental as an opportunity, not a problem, an opportunity that this city has is to dig in early on while our inmates are in jail and prepare them to come out here on day one and be productive. There are ways that the law can ensure that they have a chance to get employment and to be treated fairly and I'm gonna absolutely focus on that. I'd like to invite your opinion on something, not you as an elected, uh, first elected attorney general, but as an intellectual, as a man who reflects about issues and things of the world. In liberal democracies today, all over the world, we are facing a serious problem because of the control of interest groups, criminal activities, whether it's human trafficking, drugs, yes. and so forth, where people are losing faith in liberal democracy. And they are losing faith in politicians who make promises. But when the time comes to walk the walk, they don't deliver. And democracy is suffering for this. It's not only in locally, or state, or national, it's global. It's a global issue we face. What is your reflection on this issue? Uh, how do we go about tackling this? I, that's a huge question that you're, you're posing, and you're, you're right. You see that uh, certainly locally in the United States uh, with respect to the, um, the participation rate in, in elections. And recently, the, it's uh, dr dramatically, uh, d d decreased dramatically. It's because there's apathy. And I think what we have to do is uh, educators like you and thought leaders like you and others have to go about reminding people that they have the power, that it is really the people who elect officials, and that apathy is the worst result for any, uh, any 
potential for positive change. We can inspire people like yourself. You're new, you're fresh, it's your first election, you're dynamic, you're a bright guy. You probably could move people and inspire them, but we need to do more. What do you think can be done? Is it to get citizens to be more actively participant? I teach civics, and in America it's like uh, right. up and down, right? Right. Uh, people are always very busy. They don't have time. Some sure. people want to do things, but they can't. Um, how are we going to get over this? Because everybody looks to America as a citadel of liberal democracy, and they refer to America. And if here in America things are going down, then the world may slant towards dictatorships. And this is what my concern is. What do you think about it when sometimes you're alone and you're thinking of the world? Well, and with your profession and your experience, what insight do you get to that? Well, you know, I think that uh, leadership uh, can exist outside of government and indeed does every day. And that it is so important for those people, be it students or business leaders or the, uh, the folks in philanthropy or in the volunteer world to very much organize themselves and really communicate the message out as to all that they're doing to uplift people. Um, in other words, I think that perhaps liberal democracy needs competition. And that competition has to come in a way from those bright lights who are doing the right thing with their lives every single day to make things better for other people. I will give you an opportunity to share one reflection, not only with the people of Washington, D.C. metro area, but the 22 outlets we have in the Caribbean, New York, Philadelphia, and Canada. First, I would like to uh, honor my own uh, Caribbean roots um, and the, the spirit of being from you know, a range of diversity, certainly Africa, uh, certainly New America, Asia, um, and all of the richness that diversity and hard work and promise of education brings. It's that energy that allows for the greatest opportunity for our youth. Hard work, honesty, uh, and multiculturalism. Thank you. You've mentioned one word that is very important, the youth. Thank you very much, uh, our newly elected, or first elected, newly elected Attorney General in the District of Columbia, Mr. Carl Rassi. Thank you for being on Carp Nation. And I thank the students and professors who are here listening to the great reflections that you have shared with us today. We look forward to having you again with us. Thank you so much, Paul.